Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, uh, CES. And uh, it's a special uh, thrill to be here with you tonight because we had to cancel the last Sunday's church service. And this coming Friday is Christmas Day. So we are not going to have the Fun Fellowship Friday program. I'm sure everybody would rather spend Christmas with their, their families. If, so um, uh, let's uh, enjoy this time together tonight that we have. Uh, we're beginning a new book, uh, another one of Paul's letters, uh, Philippians. So get your Bibles ready, and we will start in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, but let's say hello to everybody first. Uh, Sister Renee? Yeah. Hey there, beloved saints. Uh I am so sorry I wasn't with you last week to finish uh, the book of Ephesians we were on, uh, but I am so looking forward to starting this epistle by Paul. Uh, I always learn something when I study with you guys, so I'm excited about it. Yeah, amen. It's so much better studying uh, with others the way that we do it here. It's, uh, if I If I compare... Like when I did the book of Galatians on my own, and then we did the book of Galatians together, and I, I was I was looking back to see how I did it. I thought, wow, there's, it's just so much better having everybody's input instead of just mine. Uh, so Ben, uh, we're uh, happy that you're uh, well enough to be with us tonight. We, I was actually quite worried about you, uh, but uh, you're feeling about 95% better, right? Yep, that's right. I'm, I'm pretty much fully recovered. Um, I just have some soreness in my throat, but that's about it. That's not a big deal. I was happy to recover very quickly and back, back, uh, back to recovery. And um, it feels like a long time since we've we've. It's only been a week, but it seems like it's been longer. Well, Renee was gone last week, so that may might might account for part of it. But it's just really good to have both you guys back. And I agree with Renee. I learn every time I study with you guys, and I consider it an investment. Um, the greatest investment, you know, great greater investment than, you know, investing in gold or any any uh, metal <laughs> or any other value on this earth. So I really value it, and uh, I miss everyone in the chat too. It's good to I'll have you all here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. So uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm glad you had a quick recovery. Uh, not only do we love you and care about you, but uh, we depend on you. Obviously, we we you you wanted to on Sunday produced a program, uh, even though you were sick, but um, I'm glad that we just didn't do it because you needed to rest. And I, I was uh, especially tired that day too. So, <clears throat> but I'll tell you what, it's been so wrong for so long, but it's so right tonight. Woo-hoo! Woo! Wow! Thank you, Jesus. Woo-hoo! <laughs> wow! Wow! Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. I guess now we can focus on the study now that we've got our salutation ready. And uh, Hendrix taught us last program that uh, at the end it's called a valediction. So there's the salutation for, for the church. Uh, anything before we go into verse one, Renee or Ben? Okay. Nope. <clears throat> um, Ben, how's your voice? Do you, do you would you like to read, or Renee, either one of you would like to read? Because I I still think it's better if I don't read and save my voice because I still lose my voice if I if I talk very long. Yeah, I could read. It's probably most convenient for me to do it. So unless Renee, you want to, but I'm happy to do it. Renee, would you like to do it? To read the scriptures? Yeah, would, rather than me doing the reading the way that I normally do, uh, have yeah, you or Ben do it? Yeah, that's fine. You want to? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, all right. Well, I guess uh, read verse one and two together. It looks like there's. No, I don't have the, all the other versions. I'll Maybe do the ben. other. Yeah, you do the KJV. I'll do the other. Okay. So okay. that's a split of work there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so the salutation here is Paul and Timotheus, the the servants of Jesus Christ. So it's from Paul and Tim Timothy the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Oh, since it's a semicolon, I'll continue. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. As we see, it's just a salutation, but reading all those, including the leaders, 
as well as all the saints which are in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, and it's from Paul and Timothy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. Obviously, as we probably could think of some things to say about the, the salutation, but uh, um, not not really, and not much needs to be said. Uh, ben, give me your thoughts on those first two verses. Yeah, just real quick, um, just to provide some background information about the epistle in general, uh, I think it's sometimes helpful. Um, with regards to the date of the epistle, um, I think a lot of people, it's generally considered, rec I, I, I mean, I'm sure there's all kinds of opinions, but um, the the commentary I've read suggests that uh, it, it, it was written, it, one of Paul's four prison epistles, written around AD 60 to 62, and um, and so it likely was written around that time period, and when 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 uh, Paul was part of the uh, one of his first missionary, uh, one of his first gospel missions to Philippi, it's recorded in Acts sixteen. Uh, after he left Asia Asia Minor, um, Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Luke um, crossed over into Macedonia, and when they arrived in Philippi, uh, Paul went down to the river to a Sabbath prayer meeting. I, I, this is all in Acts 16. Paul went down to the river to a Sabbath prayer meeting of the women. There, Paul led Lydia to Christ, and the Philippian church was born. Paul and Silas spent some time in prison in Philippi for disturbing the peace uh, following the casting out of a demon from a fortune teller, uh, which is a really interesting story, by the way, with the, the, the spirit of Python, um, where they were basically, I don't, I don't know, it's almost like they were mocking the gospel. Uh, Actually, she was, she was telling the uh, giving good fortune to, uh, to the people. She was um, telling them that this, these listen to these men; they have a way of salvation. Uh, and so, uh, anyways, uh, Philippi was a Roman colony, uh, populated mainly by veterans of the Roman military, and uh, Philippi is is apparently the first recorded re penetrate, penetration of the gospel into Europe. Who I thought was interesting. Um, and essentially, this epistle is a, a thank you note to the church for um, supporting his uh, ministry of the gospel. And so I think that's a, a, a theme throughout the epistle is uh, how they are fellow in fellowship or partakers with him in not only of believing in the gospel, but uh, continuing it forward, preserving the gospel and spreading it. And so... Uh, that's a, that's a major theme I think that you'll you'll see, we'll see is uh, that Paul will touch on here. Uh, with regards to these verses here, um, the the you know well one thing I, it's funny is almost all Paul's epistles say the same thing in the second verse. They almost say, almost always say, "Grace be unto you and peace from the God our Father," um, and. The bishops and deacons, uh, again, a bishop and deacons are generally overseers of the church. Um, just like Luke often says that uh, the people in the chat are who are welcoming our guests and, uh, you know, just keeping order in the church overall are what be the deacons would do back back in that day. That they would take a very take care of various material needs. That's all I have for now. It was really good. A uh, lot of information, Ben. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Um, well, I told Ben earlier that uh, uh, I, uh, I have this book here called uh, What the Bible is All About by Henrietta Mears. And it's kind of a, it takes each book of the Bible and kind of gives a Reader's Digest version of the book uh, and, and um, an introduction uh, to give you a foundation so you, you know what. Uh, so I, I read about four or five pages on that to get a, the gist of Philippians. Uh, and yeah, that was an interesting point you said, Ben. That's one of the things I saw in this book here also, that uh, this is a, a Paul going to Philippi was a reaction to the man in Acts uh, asking for him to come. So there's a, there must be some agreement on that. Um, but a lot of this book is really about the joy. Uh, Paul teaching us about how to be joyful uh, no matter what. And here he is in prison. And in this book, they, they say that he's probably uh, chained to a prison guard as he's writing the letter. 
And, and, and so while uh, he and Silas can sing hymns, uh, uh, while their backs are bloody and they're imprisoned in chains, and yet they're singing hymns, this is a, an amazing testimony to the guard and all the other people witnessing it. And, uh, and not only are those people who directly witnessed it uh, affected, and now they, well, how could this person be so joyful in, in, under these conditions? But um, it's probably safe to say that they, th those uh, witnesses uh, to, of Paul and Silas, they, they probably were telling the other guards and, and uh, the other, everybody else they could about this cra crazy thing they're witnessing that these people are singing and so happy and, you know, they're, they're bloody and chains and, and yet they're full of joy. So uh, this, we'll see that this is about the joy in, in, in our living and joy in our service and joy in our fellowship. That's primarily what uh, we're going to get out of this. But uh, one of my all-time favorite verses here is in chapter 4. Uh, you've heard me quote it many times, but it talks about um, whatever is good, whatever is pure, what is lovely, what is a good report. Think on these things. So it's, um, you know, you, you hear Tony Robbins and all of these motivational speakers tell us how to have positive thinking. But that's really what Paul's saying there. The, be a positive thinker. Think about positive things instead of dwelling on, on the negative things. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited as we go forward. Uh, uh, now, this verse is, um, I hadn't really paid attention to this before, uh, really, but when it says Paul and Timoth, Timoth, Timoth I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. It's Timothy, I'm sure, uh, but uh, Tim Timotheus, or <laughs> how did you say it, Renee? Timotheus. Timotheus. Okay, that sounds better. Uh, so Paul and Timotheus, uh, Paul writes a greeting uh, for both of them, speaking for him and Timotheus. Um, one of the things that uh, this uh, book I, uh, I read earlier about this, uh, Philippians, uh, it made the point that I hadn't really thought about before, but but normally when you write a letter to somebody at the be at the beginning of the letter you give a greeting, but you don't identify your don't introduce yourself. You don't you 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 sign the letter and say who wrote it at the end, but it's Paul's routinely in all his letters he he puts his name in at the very beginning of the letter. The way like if we write a letter to somebody now, you're gonna address them and put their name at the beginning and your name is that you sign it at the very end. It could so be all the false letters being written in his name. What's that? Uh, there were, there were quite a, there's letters written in his name. He probably puts it right up front because mm -hmm. remember they were receiving letters. He said, as is, as of a letter, as from us. Mm -hmm. And so apparently people were writing letters in Paul's name. So I think that might be why he did that, put his name in the beginning in the salutation as well as the end. Yeah. Okay, let me read these first two verses in the Amplified and see how they phrase it. Uh, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed, to all the saints, God's people in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Uh, grace to you and peace that is inner calm and spiritual well-being from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so, yeah, the overseers. Let me see. How does it say it in the Amplified? It says uh, bishops and deacons. It says in the Amplified. It says overseers and deacons. So I would say that in uh, in my language, I would probably call them the the, the elders and the deacons. Um, um, all right, I guess there's nothing more. You want to say anything more or move forward? Let me see if there's any footnote there that might be helpful here on verse one and two. Uh, no, I don't see any footnotes there. That, Brother Luke, you know, one yeah. thing I would point out in all of his greetings. Why? That, like, for instance, here when it says, uh, grace be unto you in peace from God, our father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It in his greeting there it confirms that they are both in heaven. 
God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If the, if the greeting is coming from them and grace and peace is being sent from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, it implies that they are together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, another thing, too, is uh, this was very important as we uh, did uh, Galatians uh, to determine who he's talking to. Uh, but he's addressing it really to people who are saved. And, and here he's also identifying it to all the saints. Now, we know that this word saint is reserved for a believer and that you know, all believers, uh, the title of saint is is. Um, a legitimate. If you're a believer, you are a saint according to the Bible. So, uh, so we have Paul talking to the believers in Philippi. All right. Uh, let's see. We uh, let's go to verse. Uh, well, I don't know. Read, think, read one, whatever you think needs to be read together. Yeah, I, I'm going to read up to six, Ben, and hand it to you. Okay. Sounds good. All right, because that's where the uh, semicolon is. Uh, all right. Continuing on three through six. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you want me to uh, comment on that? Yes, sir. Okay, verse 6 is a uh, favorite Lordship verse, and I've even heard Free Gracers uh, use it as well. And I, I know I'm, I'm not, uh, again, I'm confident of this conclusion, so, I, so I'm going to share you what my conclusion is of what this verse is teaching and what it's not teaching. Uh, again, just my personal conviction based on study and some uh, other, reading the opinion. I always like to get a, a lot of times when I have a, a, a thing that goes against the, the, the tide, um, even though I've convinced myself it's true, I, you know, I see it in scripture that's teaching that I, it's always good to have another f free gracer to, to, uh, ping it off of and get that, uh, extra confirmation. Um, uh, uh, maybe it's just a weak, a weak point uh, uh, of mine. I don't know, but I'd like to get confirmation from others, you know, not having a, a being alone and having an opinion, especially when, again, when it, when it goes against so much tradition. But the, the thing is about Lordshippers in particular when I would say lordship, I'm referring to people who teach perseverance of the saints, not preservation of the saints in, in Christ, but the perseverance in faith and good works of the saints. I believe perseverance of the saints uh, with good works and in continuance of faith is a false doctrine. Um, and uh, it's not what the Bible teaches. That's a very Calvinistic uh, view. And they love this verse here because they say, see, God, it's saying right here, Paul's very confident uh, that of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So once you, if you are saved, if it really, quote unquote, took, then you, uh, God's going to start a good work with, within you and he doesn't do anything in vain. So uh, you're going to persevere in good works and persevere in the faith because if you fell away, well, then it just means that uh, Christ never began that work. It was never his work. And uh, I believe that this verse is taken way out of context. Um, again, I, I'm uh, I'm I'm very confident of this very thing that 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 is the case. Um, so th this verse, I believe, is teaching the good work is what Paul just said in verse five. The 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 good work is the fellowship in the gospel. And yes, we have fellowship in the gospel in the sense that we are all believers, we're saints. But the fellowship of the gospel in the greater context of Philippians, I believe. Uh, again, as I said earlier, I believe Philippians is a, basically a thank you letter to this church saying, thank you for supporting me when no one else did. I'm in prison. Thank you for supporting me when no one else did. And uh, uh, if you just bear with me for a couple minutes, I, I have some excellent commentary I'm just going to read. Uh, it, it, I, it's really excellent commentary. I think it's uh, excellent. Um, it's by my favorite Bible scholar and teacher and free grace teacher. But um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a, a few parts to to back up the point where I don't think that, again, this verse is teaching anything about God beginning a good work in you in terms of salvation. It's God beginning a good work in you as a church holistically that your, your fellowship in the gospel, your support of Paul, he's telling the church, your support of Paul, of me in the gospel, God, you, the work that you've done here, God's going to continue it. 
not necessarily even through you, but the work that you that God begun it began with this church, He's going to continue it. So let me just read a couple uh, quick paragraphs here. So it starts with it says neither the context of verse six nor the terminology used in this passage indicates that Paul is referring to the process of practical sanctification. Instead, the good work God was doing in their midst refers to the Philippians' partnership with Paul for the, for the furtherance of the gospel. Several observations support this conclusion. Verses 5 and 7 refer to the Philippians' partnership with Paul in the gospel by the expressions, quote, fellowship in the gospel, unquote, and being, quote, partakers, unquote, of grace with Paul, quote, in the fence, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, unquote. The word fellowship in verse 5, koinonia, and partakers in verse 7, uh, which is the Greek word sig koinonois, which is it's a very similar word to koinonia, are related terms, showing that Paul viewed the Philippians as sharing in, sharing in common his gospel ministry. The Philippians were truly partners with Paul in, eva in evangelism. This can be seen throughout the epistle. In verse 112, Paul wants them to know how his trials have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. In verse 119, Paul tells them that although he was imprisoned for the gospel, he knew deliverance would come through their prayer and the supply of the Holy Spirit. In, two, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 22, Paul upholds the example of Timothy, who, quote, served with me in the gospel, unquote. In verse in, in chapter three, verse three, I'm sorry, in chapter four, verse three, Paul describes certain Philippians as quote, these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, unquote. And in chapter four, verse fifteen, Paul reminds them of their original financial gift to his ministry of preaching the gospel, how that quote, in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So he's thanking these church, this church, there's that no other church supported him, but he's thanking these Philippians, you are the only church that supported me. And that's why he says, this this financial gift and your your spiritual gifts to me and support of me, that, that's the good work that has begun in you. And God, that's the work that God will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. In fact, I mean, I think it'd be silly to think that, uh, you know, God's going to get a good work in you and that you might not even, you know, you might not even be alive uh, until the day Jesus comes back uh, to the earth. So, um, and, and, and so that, that's what, one other thing. Uh, just one last thing I'll read here. Um, the occasion of Paul's writing, the occasion of Paul's writing this epistle to the Philippians is stated in uh, chapter 4, verses 10 through 18, where he ex explicitly acknowledges their most recent financial gift in addition to their past giving. The epilogue to the epistle in verse in chapter 4, verses 10 through 18, is widely and rightly regarded as forming a parallel to Paul's opening remarks in the prologue of chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Since these two sections function like bookends that introduce and restate Paul's primary reason in writing the epistle, the, quote, good work that Paul must be referring to in 1.6 is the Philippians' financial support of his ministry in furthering the gospel. So that's all I have. And there, I could, there's so much more that can be stated about in support of that, but I think those are some good highlights of of how that verse, how I, I'm convinced that that, that verse is re what it's referring to. Hmm. Well, I'll let Renee go uh, next, but you actually really blew my mind. That That is uh, amazing. So I, I'm eager to talk about it, but go ahead, Renee. What, how do you? Yeah, I, I, agree to, um, I actually, uh, I hate it when people use this as good work for to prove that if you're really saved, you'll continue like you won't fall away and to, uh, uh, bad behavior or any of that's just ridiculous. It's clear he's speaking to this church. Uh, the good work is not anything they're actually doing, but the work of the gospel in them. Uh, and I do believe this can be applied to the church, to believers as a whole. Uh, it, I believe it could be applied uh, that God, who performs a work in you, will continue it. However, I think it can also apply to this specific church as a whole 
in reference to what they had done for him. Uh, and it's just his way of saying God will continue to do that. But I do think it has more to do with the gospel and the work God did in them. Uh, and the reason I say that is because Paul mentions hope for their act, actual outward behavior later. So uh, there's no way this is talking about outward behavior as far as I'm concerned, as far as I can see. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry that I have to repeat myself so often. Uh, some people might get bored with me making the same point over and over again, but I, you have to um, give me a little bit of liberty on that because we have new people listening uh, who maybe didn't hear me make this point before. And uh, sometimes the point is so important that uh, it, it is, uh, it's worthy of being repeated over and over again to make sure everybody understands and, and, and that we all talk about, oh, well, how do you interpret the Bible? And there are certain fundamentals. Of course, most people will bring up context as the top at the top of the list. But I think there's one thing that is, uh, and maybe maybe this is an aspect of context. But there's one thing that is is um, uh, the penultimate that we have to keep in mind more so than anything else. Uh, there really is only one correct interpretation for every verse. Now we can all have our our own uh, interpretation in terms of, oh, well, I, I see this in it. And, and, and maybe some of the things that we personally uh, see, uh, uh, it, it, maybe it is a spiritual truth. Um, maybe God is revealing something to, to you in that verse that is, uh, could be valid and helpful. But what is really important is that we all try to, must strive to, to, to derive what was the intention of the writer at the time? What was the writer really trying to convey to those people at that time? And I really think that uh, I never thought about that before, Ben, but I really think now uh, my first reaction to your point is that uh, that seems to make a lot of sense in terms of um, as we go through this whole letter, we'll find out that uh, it is true that Paul was uh, a thank, wrote it as a thank you letter, thanking them for their support of the, the ministry. And, and uh, so um, the idea of them, uh, the good work that was begun is the fact that they, they're, they're supporting uh, the, the gospel, uh, the evangelism and the church planning, all that. They're, they're supporters of it. And uh, Paul, I think, is saying here that he's confident that uh, uh, the, the, the work that they began, that they, they will be, be able to continue performing it as long as it takes, even if it takes until the day the, the Lord returns. So uh, I really think in context and uh, keeping in mind what Paul was trying to convey at the time, that probably is the right answer, Ben. I'm really happy that you are, gave that to us. Um, there are there is, um, let me see, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, uh, oh, it slipped my mind what else I was going to add to it. Uh, hmm. All right, I'll think of it. I'll think of it. You know how when you forget something, you say, oh, I can't remember that? Don't say I can't remember it. Because if you say, I can't remember it, you're reinforcing it that I, I won't be able to remember. So you don't say, I'll think of it again in a minute. And let's see if that works for me this time. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, Ben or, or Renee, you want to yeah, say? I'll read the next. Uh... Oh, well, I remember now. Remember I, I okay, said good. I would do it. Good, remember. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, your, uh, your point, Ben, is actually uh, a problem for me in, in this way. Um, I'm looking at my file on the eternal security verses that I've saved. These are the verses I've gone to as the proof texts for the doctrine of eternal security. And I remember that, first, that Philippians 1.6 is one of those proof texts for eternal security because the way I've always used the verse is that uh, we can be confident that uh, he hath begun a good work and you will perform it uh, until the day of 
uh, of Jesus Christ, I applied that as a, um, a promise of eternal security that we don't need to worry because God will um, be with us and can never leave us and, and continue working on us even until the day that Jesus returns. Um, so, but I really, I don't feel now I can use that verse um, as a uh, eternal security proof text because that's really, I don't think that was the intention now at the. Well, we still kind of can because although it is referencing something they did that was good, it's stemming from fellowship of the gospel, which God will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. See, yeah, Look, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other because it says in five for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. So their fellowship in the gospel was begun by God and will continue. Their giving to Paul was a result of that. It, it's not uh, taking away from the fact that God won't, will perform that in them in the fellowship of the gospel. Do you see what I'm saying, Ben? Yeah, yeah. Th yeah. This this, this uh, commentary I read from it makes like six solid points. I already read like three of them. But one of the other points he makes is um, where he says the the good work occurring in you. He says that that it the, that pr it's a it's a prepositional phrase that can also be translated as among you, and and that Greek preposition uh, is often used in a corporate sense. Uh, that in, in other words, it means among rather than in. In fact, that's exactly how it's translated and used in Philippians two fifteen, where Paul writes, "Among whom you shine as lights in the world." So, I, I, I'm convinced. I mean, I, again, I, you have to read the commentary, same commentary I did, but he really goes into Greek, and a lot of times you see patterns in Greek, like you see related terms, which are abstracted in the English a little bit, and um, it, it, and just also, too, just looking at the themes, the recurring themes throughout the epistle, it's all about, the, I think the epistle is essentially about being selfless, and giving, and, and huh? you know, serving others and well the first way the best way you can serve others in god is with the gospel essentially so that's exactly what they were doing they were serving paul um in his mission and so they are partakers and they will be richly rewarded for it um and, and the only reason i mentioned all of that is because uh it's funny you guys thought it was a or I, I, and i have no problem thinking it's, a, it's an eternal security verse but a lot of lordshippers and calvinists use it to say oh see if you didn't, if you didn't per, uh, uh, persevere, or you you, you backslid, uh, well then you're a false convert. And uh, they love corporate. this verse. They love this verse. Yeah, this is corporate though. It, it's clear it's talking about yes. the church. God will work it in the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's very interesting. Um, any more, or should we move on? Well, the last. Uh, I think what he's basically said again to, to sum it up here. I've heard the saying quoted by pastors, and I think this kind of summar summarizes what Paul is essentially saying. So a, a common phrase is, God buries his workmen, but continues his work. So, uh, you know, we, we are just, uh, we are instruments used by him. And uh, even though we might not finish his work, we can never finish his work. We can be used as, as a, you know, as an instrument in, that pro in the progress of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, the church as a whole. It, the church will be used consistently until Christ returns. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'll read uh, verse 7, which was, that was a semicolon now, but so I'll read it all together. Verse 6 was being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, it's worthy or appropriate of me to think this because I have you in my heart and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. And again, this clearly refers to, uh, as Ben was saying, they're, um, they're giving to him uh, while he's in prison. Because uh, it says, and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel and in evangelism and 
helping the apostles and disciples and anyone who's taken the gospel outward, this church seems to be supporting gospel preachers the and being preachers of the gospel themselves because it says ye are all partakers of my grace so it it seems that uh based on the work the philippian church is doing uh that they're partakers with paul in the gospel and uh, in service to the gospel while helping him while he was in prison that's what it seems like here uh for verse seven what saith you mr ben <clears throat> Um, well, I, yeah, I totally agree. He says, the, it, it, I think that's, again, related to the uh, the continuing the work, that the, the work that they're going to complete is defense and confirmation of the gospel. And, I, and so, uh, again, they're, they're, they're like uh, backup support for Paul in terms of the gospel that we, you know, that we all depend on each other. And so they're supporting him and his mission. And in that sense, uh, that's the work that he is confident that God will uh, continue. You know, God didn't. God didn't put him in. Uh, God didn't put. He. I think he was confident that he was his uh, mi ministry wasn't going to end in prison, and neither was the was the church going to die. He knew that uh, God ha had a purpose, and uh, God's hand was in all of this, even though he was cha in chains. Yet, you know, he was he was commissioned by God uh, to go out and spread the gospel, and yet he was chained. <laughs> and so, I think God did that part partly to show that the word of God should not be chained, even though. Uh, his saints can be chained. The word itself cannot be chained. And one thing I thought peculiar, though, is that the word defense and confirmation of the gospel. And, uh, and I'm not sure what he means by confirmation. Um, it, it, it's almost like, uh, actually, it, so I'm looking at the uh, Strong's Concordance, and actually another word for confirmation is stablement. So it's like making it, um, and I, again, that tiny in, in accordance with his idea of continuing the work. He makes the work stable or steadfast. Uh, you know, um, so he's, he's, he's confident that, uh, that they are, um, even though he's in chains, the defense and, and, the, and the gospel, again, cannot be unchained. And he's confident that it, it'll continue. Uh, and they are partakers because of that, because they're supporting Paul, essentially. So I think, again, he's kind of expressing uh, he's, he's thankful, even though he's in prison. He's still thankful. He's still got he's got the long view. He knows that God's in control, and that whatever for whatever reason he's changed, it's it's for the good. It's good for the good of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you made some good points, but you surprised me uh, when you were felt unsure about the word confirmation. Um, I mean, you're uh, intelligent and educated. I don't. I don't think the word confirmation is a complicated word to understand. Um, uh, T i o n on the end of a word means the act of, so that means it's the act of confirming something. And so, um, what in what sense? You know, in what sense is he confirming it? That's what I'm okay, yeah. I'm, I'm trying, going to go to that next. Is, is that if you present the gospel, and I say Amen, I agree. That's right. Then I'm confirming that what you said is correct. And so it's not only defending that uh, the, the fact that, uh, hey, uh, we know the gospel, but this is what it is. And, we, and, and everybody says, I confirm that. Uh, that's how nice. I see that. I wanted yeah. to. Um, OK, I. You've heard me mention Bible Jim a number of times. I, I don't even know if he's alive. He's about five or six years older than me. Uh, we we had a, a falling out years ago over. He, he was very tolerant of street preachers uh, who were preaching the false gospel. But he said, at least they're doing something. Most Christians are sitting on their butts, won't do anything. And I said, my conclusion was, well, I'd rather have them stay home and do nothing because they're sharing a, a, a teaching a false gospel. They're doing more harm than good. So I, I had to part company over that. But uh, I, I still think that he had an awful lot of good uh, you know, works in his ministry. Uh, and one of the things that he, I remember him saying uh, so many times is that basically, do you want a piece of the action? And that is that like he would make, he was the one that had all the equipment and the expertise to make signs. You know, see all these signs that the street preachers are holding? Uh, maybe over the last 15 years, 
uh, other people were making signs. Uh, but before that, most of the signs across America were made by Bible Jim for preachers all over. And uh, he never charged anybody for, for those things, but he, he would, you know, a lot of people know that, look, if you will contribute to the cost of producing this stuff, so it's not all on me, uh, then basically what you do is you're getting a piece of the action because the reward system uh, is uh, there are going to be rewards for what we're doing. And, and, and if you're supporting it, then you're going to share in those rewards. So by, uh, by financially supporting these things, uh, uh, and I think that's that's what I got when you were, when we were talking about verse uh, is it seven? Or, yeah, let me see. Let me read seven in the Amplified. Uh, it is it is right for me to feel this way about you because you have me in your heart as I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the news of the good news regarding salvation, all you share in his matchless grace with me. <clears throat> so the fact that they're sharing in his ministry, whatever he produces and whatever good fruit comes from his ministry, they're sharing in it because they are supporting it financially. It would not be possible maybe for him to go and travel and do the things he did if it wasn't for them, uh, you know, funding it. Um, all right. Um, Either of you want to add more? Uh, I, I would think, yeah, I, I like your idea of, of the uh, confirmation. I, I just couldn't uh, got, grasp what, with what sense did he mean. Um, but um, what you just said also, too, with regards to uh, getting in on the action, you know, that's exactly what uh, Matthew 10, 41 teaches, where Christ said, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So we're, we are, uh, that's how we're partakers um, in, in, the, in the furtherance of the gospel. And in, like I said, I think we'll be richly, richly rewarded for it. A shadow of that is with Elijah and the widow. A shadow of what you just said. Could, could you uh, explain that story a little bit? Okay. Well, uh, in the Old Testament, Elijah, there was a famine in the land. And Elijah went not to an Israelite but to a pagan woman. Uh, and there was a great famine and there was nothing left but a tiny bit of oil and flour. She was going to make one cake for her and one for her son and they were going to lay down to die of starvation. So Elijah shows up at her house. Now it's interesting that Jesus, both times he mentioned great faith, they were not Jews. Naaman, he was from Syria. Then uh, the widow, she was in an area that it was not a, she wasn't a Jew. Both times he named non-Jews. I think that was a smack in the face of them. But they, uh, when Elijah came, he said, no, instead of, instead of doing that, feed me. So in faith, she took care of the man of God, a prophet of God. And because she did that, her oil and, and flour never ran out. Supernaturally, she continued to get oil and flour out of the same containers until the famine was over. So a shadow of taking in a righteous man. What was the verse you used, Ben? It was Matthew 10, 41. Receiving a prophet or a righteous man, you receive right. the yes. reward. I believe that that's a, a shadow of it here on earth, an actual temporal, earthly uh, uh, standard. You know what I mean? Like a, a shadow of that. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I, I was going to uh, read uh, seven and eight and let you go. Is it all right if I let me, read let me, uh, let, me say, let me respond to what you said though sure. for some here. Uh, uh, you said there, you got out of two examples, uh, and you mentioned Naaman. Um, I, I recognize the name, but I can't remember how to place it. But uh, uh, the, the one that came to my mind, and maybe his name was Naaman, but when Jesus was talking to the centurion that uh, said, uh, uh, just just say the words, and right. be, you, know, you don't need to go to my home because you have authority. You can just speak the words. And Jesus said, 
talked about what great faith he had, I believe. Was that was that Naaman or is it different? Naaman was the Syrian that that came to the prophet, uh, is it Elijah or Elisha? Anyway, and he and he told him to go dunk in the river. He had leprosy. He told him to dunk himself seven times. He goes, Hey, we got better rivers it where I'm from and you know, Damascus River and all this stuff. Why am I gonna go to some river in Israel? Why is that any better? But he went ahead and did it and he was cured of leprosy. Uh, so, but those are the two examples mentioned by Jesus uh, for people of great faith. But the the widow is the one that actually worked along with what Ben was saying. If you receive a prophet or a righteous man, uh, then you receive the reward of a prophet or a righteous man. And she received the prophet and got the reward uh, for doing so. And uh, that's just what made me think of think of the widow okay yeah and i also see like receiving like you receive the holy spirit you receive a righteous person because you recognize the right you you receive them by faith you you, you recognize mm-hmm. them as as sent from god right right i'm gonna go through to seven and eight okay, sure. seven is short okay um i mean uh eight and nine i'm sorry okay. we already read for god is my record how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and all judgment. I'll continue to tend because the semicolon that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Hmm. Okay. Uh, actually, do you mind if I read verse 11 too? Okay. Sure. Just because, okay, so in, in verse 11 it says, uh, well, let me read the KJV. Uh, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. And the reason I wanted to read that is, um, you know, God, don't, because, we're, because we're filled with the Holy Spirit, he, we have the ability to bear that fruit of righteousness. And so God empowers us to live a victorious and... Uh, uh, a spirit-filled Christian life, uh, and it's our 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 volition to to yield to it and uh, allow Him to do that work. Or we could say, "No, I'm just going to fl- fall, uh, follow my fleshly desires and kind of ignore spiritual matters, uh, like Esau did." Uh, but again, uh, you would be if you do that, you're going to be loose out rewards, which is your birthright, which is another way of saying. I believe is uh, the day of Christ. The day of Christ is the when the day when Christ comes onto Earth and rules and reigns. And so our birthright in Christ, uh, our inheritance, if you will, or, or the, our reward of the inheritance, is our right to. We all will rule with Christ in some sense, but some believers obviously will uh, have greater area, get greater responsibility. And so God, again, God's given us the power source, the Holy Spirit, to live. A victorious Christian life, and uh, he wants us to be not short-sighted, but to again be be uh, drunk on the Holy Spirit, if you will, and uh, drunk on it with by uh, with our love for for Him and for one another. Um, and I, you know, I, Paul says here that you know how much he greatly longed to have uh, to have them. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the the bowels of Jesus Christ. Let me read that in New King James. Um, where does that say? Uh, what verse is that again? The bowels of Jesus Christ. What on earth does that mean? For God is my witness, and the New King James says, "For God is my witness, how greatly I long for, long for you with for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ." Okay, I can understand that. <laughs> um, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I know, I, I, you know, I. This fellowship is great, and it's, it's, it, it's the best thing that I can think of. I mean, I, you guys are the the most spirit filled believers I've ever met, and yet it it kills me that we we can't meet in person. You know, I, I hope we will one day on mm-hmm. Earth. Um, uh, but I can, I so I can understand Paul's, um, you know, his uh his yearning to do that. And, um, so again, I, I, I definitely can understand that. We could probably, we all could probably understand that. Um, and so that would, that'd be all I'd say on those verses. 
Yeah, uh, you see the word bowels used a lot. They're different in today's vernacular, but it 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 usually refers to a deep inner affection, like uh, to the core of our being. So um, I want to go like here. And this I pray your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment so that everything that they do is based on righteous judgment. You'll, uh, uh, let's see. I'll continue before I say it. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So uh, your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So uh, I've heard some say uh, reading, I, I don't read commentary very much, but I remember uh, a reference to the Corinthian church here. And what that makes me think of is when Paul wrote to them and the man was having an affair with his father's wife. And he said, you have not mourned. They, they loved him, but not in knowledge and judgment. Proper love at that point. The, the world likes to say love is accepting everybody and what they're doing. Okay. Even if God says it's wrong. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying we are to love and have right judgment. So uh, it's important to the church because if you don't correct certain things that God says evil, it gives the church a bad name and it, and it harms the church. We're supposed to be a light to the world. It doesn't mean you condemn people and call them names and threaten them. It just means if we only deal, actually I'm doing a video after this to answer this question. We only deal with behaviors inside the church. Do you understand that? It's none of our business what people outside are doing. We're not supposed to go try and correct that. Like Paul said, we'd have to leave the world to get away from that wickedness. But here, when he says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Um, so that, that is within the church, um, because loving people without knowledge and judgment, one, you'll accept false teachers. You'll accept, uh, people that are not really of the Lord into the church and you won't correct or address harmful behavior. That's not love. It's not, um, uh, Jesus always spoke truth. So that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And most of that is discerning truth and discerning what God says the church should be doing, as well as, you know, the, the preservation of the gospel here. So uh, when it says being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Now, the righteousness of God is in all believers that should. And I'll use the word should because it's our purpose and it's what God commands of his people, his children should extend outward in our behavior and love of others unto the glory and praise of God. That's the purpose of it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I'll like to read it in the Amplified and then I'll give my thoughts. Uh, let me see, eight through 11, right? <clears throat> for God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus, whose great love fills me. And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more, displaying itself in greater depth, in real knowledge, and in practical insight, so that you may learn to recognize and treasure what is excellent. Uh, that is identifying the best and distinguishing 
moral differences and that you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, actually living lives that lead others away from sin. Hmm. Yeah, well, um, we've often talked about how um, uh, all the accusations against Paul in the letters uh, uh, where he has to defend himself from all these false charges uh, he's not a real apostle, that he's given people a license to sin, and, and so on and so on, and that he's against the law, he's antinomian. And, uh, the, we, we should, we are experiencing attacks in the same, for the same reasons that Paul was, because we're in agreement with Paul. And if you're not getting attacked, uh, then maybe you better take a little time to meditate on that and wonder why you're, you're escaping it because you, we should all be attacked if we're doing the same thing as Paul because the world doesn't agree in this, you know, free gift uh, salvation. Um, so, but, but Paul here is talking about how, uh, look, we want you to live moral lives. It's, it's not something that uh, we, you're just going to wink at and, and just, it doesn't matter. Go ahead and live however you like. You've got a license to sin all you want, so we'll just ignore it. Uh, no, he, he does preach and teach that um, uh, we are to be, like Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Um, and obviously, we're not much of a light if we're just like the world, you know, just obviously just as sinful, um, even outwardly where it's so obvious to everybody, what kind of a witness do you have if you're not different than the world? Uh, but when people can say, wow, uh, I remember you from like 10, 20 years ago, and man, you're, I, I never would have thought that you would have changed so much uh, your your interests and your your the things you you're involved in are so different than in the past and uh, they you you should have that kind of a record where people can see that look god has changed you now it, let's not go too far with that to require it because we all respond to the holy spirit differently some people the Holy Spirit is trying to direct us in a certain way, and we they resist it. They not only resist it, and the Spirit gets grieved, but they continue to resist it, so the Spirit gets quenched. And, and uh, but then other people, they uh, they have this great desire to to um, embrace the Spirit's promptings and, and uh, give their life over and say, "I surrender, God, you 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 direct me now, and, and change me." Uh, and when you when you have that attitude, then those people normally you you see great changes in them, uh, and so that's what Paul wants. Uh, it, and we we certainly agree. Where we've been falsely charged too that we we don't care about you know sin. <clears throat> okay, um, you guys want to say more or move on? Well, I was just going to say that the word for, where it says knowledge and judgment in the King James, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's you can reckon yourself that it it basically means discernment with regard to judgment, um, like, you know, discernment, judgment. Um, so that it says you may approve all things are excellent. It reminds me of the passage. I don't remember what, where it's at, but Paul says, I want you to be wise with regarding what is good, but simple, what is evil. Um, you know, we don't need to be spending all our time uh, investigating the depths of evil. We should be spending our time uh, investigating and considering and ruminating on the things of of good. What's good? That's what we should our our mind things that are noble, things that are lovely, etc. And um, and 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 also too, where it says where you may be sincere without offense. Whenever I see the word sincere in the Bible, it also you know it's it, it's also coupled often coupled with the idea of purity or or unhip unhypocritical. So grace is unhypocritical um, because it just gives with no no uh, idea or expectation of a return. Uh, just like God gave his son. He doesn't expect anything in return except for us to believe it. Um, and whereas, uh, you know, with, whereas 
And so God wants to work uh, us to operate on those grace principles that we should be living our lives in that in that sense, not not uh, with law principles like treating other believers like, well, I'll I'll love you if you love me, or I'll do this for you if you do, do this for me, or but if you don't do this for me, then I'm going to treat you poorly. We aren't supposed to return evil with evil, and that's where uh, again that's law principles, and that's where. When you're operating in law, well, that's where you can have a defense. So we should operating operate on uh, grace principles, and that's why he yeah. says uh, we, we should be sincere because, uh, and the way we are to do that is to be fulfilled, fulfilled with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's the only thing I would add. Yeah, and also uh, uh, grace. Uh, if we abide only in the doctrine of grace as far as salvation, no one can lift themselves up above another and thus take the hypocrite out. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. Also, too, when you said that Elijah story and that uh, with the cakes and the oil, you said it, that never ran out. That's a picture of grace, too, where grace never runs out. Yep. And again, a non-Jew. No right. law. No law. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Ben, again, when you when you were a little puzzled by the word bowels, I was a little surprised by that also. Uh, I, I don't want to harp on this because tonight there's two things you, you said that you were a little confused about, but, but you're you're you have great understanding. So it just kind of surprised me on those two points that you were kind of at a loss. But the um, the congregation came through because I looked at the comments in the chat room. I listened to Renee, and uh, I say amen to everybody's thoughts about the word bowels. But um, um, I, I, there's another thing, um, part of our body that the scriptures talk about that uh, people they don't seem to understand either, and that is the heart. And um, uh, of course, Paul says that if you um, believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. Well, what's it mean to believe with your heart? And uh, in Acts, the Philippian jailer wanted to get baptized, and and, uh, and I mean the uh, the, the eunuch. <laughs> Did I say Philippian jailer? Um, the, Philip and the eunuch. So you're close. <laughs> Philip and the eunuch. <laughs> yeah, the Ethiopian eunuch wanted to get baptized. So Philip uh, says, "Well, if you believe with your whole heart," and and uh, so. All this really means when it talks about heart or bowels, either way, is that it is, this is a really sincere, deep, heartfelt, sincere uh, um, belief you have here. Um, all right, but... Um, yeah, it was just the wording, the bowels of... It's not like, would it, would it say the bowels of Jesus Christ? See, I don't, I don't yeah. read... I don't uh, often read the, new, the King James. That's my... That's probably why. Uh, I look at the new King James... Uh, Primarily, and, and the the uh, uh, NASB. I think both are both of those are, are my preferred. Just their NASB is uh, very literal or more mechanical, uh, and I like that. Uh, I don't like I like as little translation as possible. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's part of why it threw me off. Um, and the wording was weird too. It's not like it's in the bowels of Jesus Christ, which is. Um, not like uh, I have to read it again, but anyways, yeah, I, I'm a I'm a a student as much as I'm a teacher, so I'm not gonna pretend I I have all the answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a weird uh, way to speak, but we don't speak that way anymore, so you kind of have to dig through. Uh, I'm gonna read a uh, twelve through fourteen because it's all a continuing thought, and you can't really discuss twelve without them. All right, uh, and I I actually love this. <clears throat> it's, it's one of my favorite verses, actually. Um, so 12 through 14, but I would, you should understand brethren that the things what's happened unto me have fallen out rather than unto the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are made are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And I love verse 12 because Paul is literally saying, I know you guys think because I've been put in prison and I've been beaten and all this stuff, that it's a hindrance to the gospel, but it actually is helping to further the gospel message uh, because people are hearing about it and it's allowing the gospel to be spoken boldly. 
uh, so that men understand that even if the worst you, you fear happens to you, that God is using it for his glory. And so here he says, I, I would that you should understand, brethren, the things would happen to me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So it's not it's not hurting the gospel message. God did not lose here when I was put in prison. He used it so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident in my bond by my bond so him being in prison is actually making other people bold or much more bold to speak the word without fear because he sees that god is using paul and his bondage to get the gospel preached and so i love that you know everything we think uh, is coming against us and my little thing you know when people lie about me and say I promote sin and I'm of the devil and accuse me. I never make videos against those people or in my defense because I have had so many people say I came here because so-and-so made a video accusing you of this and I got saved because you preached the gospel in the video. So when people try to hurt you or to shut down the truth of the gospel, God's only using these things to get people to the gospel. And here, Paul is saying the same thing. I, I just, I love this concept of what Paul is preaching here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you, so you both spoke on 12 through 14, didn't no, you? No, I, I have it. Yeah. But, oh, all right, go ahead, then, Ben. Go ahead. Okay, well. Again, uh, I, I I agree with everything with Renee said, and this was kind of what I was saying earlier, where Paul said in, in verse six, with that controversial verse, that he was confident that what God would start would would he was he had confidence that what God was uh, uh, the good work that he started in them, he would continue with it. And now we see he's confident that that was the case, even though he's in prison, he was confident that the work their support of him was not in vain. And now I think he's actually explained why he has that confidence because it actually uh, resulted in the furtherance of the gospel. And why did it result in the furtherance of the gospel? Because Paul, the the palace guard, the prisoners uh, were there that, that became believers, probably because he was so bold and confident in preaching the gospel and singing uh, Jesus' praises uh, in the midst of affliction and persecution that they were stunned by it. it you know, that's It's a supernatural thing. And, and it probably contributed to leading them to faith in addition to the, the message. Um, and again, Paul, and so again, because Paul, Paul's confident that their support of him is not in vain, just as his confidence uh, exhibited to this palace guard, I believe, brought them to faith in Christ. Or even if they're already believers, uh, gave them confidence and they became more bold. Um, uh, yes, in fact, it says are they are much because they see, even though Paul's chained up, they see that he's confident. He's a role model, and so they become more more bold and confident. Uh, they see that you know Paul, a, a man sent of God, he's not cowering and and, and throwing in the, throwing in the towel. No, he's actually getting more confident and praising Jesus all the more. And so it led to the furtherance of the gospel persecution off of the Bible always leads to multiplication. Uh, you see that in um, even in the Israelites where the Egyptians persecuted them, but yet they well, even they're, they gave birth even uh, quicker or they had more uh, hearty births. Or, I don't know how the Bible phrased it, but they were uh, the maid, the maid uh, servant said that they, you know, why did you throw these uh, children into, into the river um, or into the Nile? They said, well, they, they, they're born before, uh, before we get there, because they're so hardy, because they're being persecuted. So persecution always breaks about multiplication, and I think I think that's a perfect case here. So whenever we're being persecuted, you, we we can uh, be sure, especially if it's being per persecuted for the cause of Christ, and not because we're doing evil, but being persecuted for righteous purposes. Um, we can we can be confident that it's being used uh, by God for the furtherance of the gospel. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll, I'll comment on these verses, but I also um, need to comment on this uh, 
problem in the chat room here. And um, I would hope that everyone that's a moderator uh, has read uh, the protocols for the for the chat room. Uh, I'm going to cite one of the bullet points uh, or rules of the, that. But first, let me just try to get back to focus on these verses here. Uh, uh, let's see, what verse was it? Which verses were they? Uh, anybody want to tell me? Is it 12 or 11? What, what are we? Yeah, we're at 14, I believe. Wasn't it? 12 14. Okay, I'll read it in the Amplified, even though Mike uh, says that it's a. I'm, I'm making a serious error by every he using. Didn't understand we use. He's been here many times. I don't know why he doesn't understand we go. No, I, I think he's probably recently listened to somebody who's the KJV only, and now he's going to. But whether he likes it or not, he's you know he has to accept that, and uh, uh, that's what that's what we do. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm King James first. It's the only version I use, but I don't object to you referring to other versions. Yeah, but the way that he uh, uh, was uh, reacting to it was was unacceptable. Yeah, but I'll, let's go. I'll read. Uh, begin with verse twelve. Um, now I want you to know, believers, that what has happened to me—that is, this imprisonment that was meant to stop me—has actually served to advance the, the spread of the good news regarding salvation. Uh, my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become common knowledge throughout the whole Praetorian Imperial Guard and to everyone else. Uh, be because of my chains, seeing that I am doing well and that God is accomplishing great things, most of the brothers have renewed confidence in the Lord and have far more courage to speak the word of God concerning salvation without fear of the consequences, seeing that God can work his good in all circumstances. Hmm. Well, uh, this is this probably a perfect example of, of why I like to look at the Amplified. Uh, I don't even need to say anything after that. That that was such an excellent job of amplifying and explaining the situation, uh, what Paul was conveying, that it should be clear to everybody now. So I won't really even comment on that those verses because the Amplified did it so well. Uh, but let me, uh, let, uh, as we're finishing up here now, uh, here, let me post this. Uh, I don't think I can post this in the uh, uh, public chat, so I'll put it here in the private space here. I think it'll show up on the screen just for a moment if it's that's the way it normally is. Uh, let's see. All right, I guess not. You, you don't have it set up that way for tonight, I guess. But... Um, Read it. Or read something. Here's the the protocol. I, I want every moderator to read the protocols that come on the beginning of the, each of our programs. You and, want me to read it? Read it. Um, you want to read? Yeah, go ahead and read all the protocols. But then when we get to the what this one particular point, uh, there was a violation of this tonight that we need to to, to mention. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll just. It's pretty lengthy. I think I probably just. I'll just read this okay, one. Okay, well, I'll just read the um the the one point that okay. uh, uh, that is uh, we're concerning. Okay, it says if a moderator disagrees with the decision and action of another moderator, we must not challenge or argue with them in the chat room. We should ask to speak privately with them. At that time, we can discuss the problem and try to come to an understanding. If we conclude that the judgment was unfair and not according to these chat room protocols, then the complaint should be brought to the church panel for further discussion at a later time. But we should not have one moderator um, correcting the decision of another moderator or, or undermining their decision because whether the person made the right decision or wrong, uh, we, we should not be having that uh, in a public chat room as, as saying uh, one moderator challenging another. So um, if you've done that, I want you to know that that's against the rules. Uh, now, what Mike has done is, is a violation. 
And we've had a lot of problems with, with Mike. It seems like every single program we have now, Mike becomes a problem in there by wanting to bring up things that uh, we say, hey, that's not the subject that we're discussing. That's something personal that you need. If you need private counseling, then we can discuss that. But he's continuing every single program we have now. There's a problem that we have to deal with Mike. So, uh, you know, Mike was... Um, uh, removed from the congregation for a couple of months and given another chance, but he's pushing. I think he, Mike, if you're listening, you're, you're pushing it to beyond the limit now. So we're going to have to have a, another conversation. And uh, I, I can't have you becoming a problem in every one of our programs. Um, but let's get, um, let's give our summary uh, thoughts. And if you want to say about anything about that, Ben or, or Renee, you can, but uh, also let's sum up our thoughts on the study tonight. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, we let's always remember we're supposed to be better, better, more loving than the world. We're supposed to be slow to respond to our flesh. And I, I love what Brother uh, Luke's friend says. Dead men do not get offended. It is quick to get offended, get annoyed. I know I am. I have no patience. I am bad with that. And so now I know I, I, I breathe and I count so that I can think clearly without jumping right into my flesh. Cause I know that's a weakness for me. Um, and you know, if, if you're dead, then nothing said to you is personal. And even if somebody speaks against something you believe or the gospel, I am zealous for the gospel and I will correct it. But I have to get outside of myself sometimes and not take personal offense to it. Because I, I hate pride and legalism and all of it. And especially those of us who were saved by God's grace, we should be slow to be legalistic on anything. And um, I just want to remind everybody, we are ambassadors for Christ. There's never time off for not for that. We, we are always, when we call ourselves Christian, we are held to a higher standard, whether you want to be or not. And so we got to try to remember that. But uh, I love what uh, all the work you did, Ben. Uh, when we started this chapter, uh, I appreciate that. I also appreciate uh, the context of that popularly used verse. Uh, God knows that's not the first out of context verse uh, we've heard uh, Lordship Salvationist or Calvinist use. So regardless of whether we want to look at that verse as an eternal security verse, I do, even with the context that's in it. I do believe it can be an eternal security verse for the simple fact that God did begin a good work in each one of us and he will finish that in his church. Then the point you made that even when we're gone, the church continues to do God's work and we can be a part of that an instrument of that while we're here. And I believe that God, began a work in the church and will finish his work in the church till the day of Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, I appreciate that we went over the context of that because I, I really do hate verses taken out of their context, but I, I believe that it, it still could be as long as you, as long as we know what the true meaning was when Paul wrote it, um, I think it still stands true that whether you want to look at it, because it was a corporate you, not just you personally, but you as a church, uh, that that's true. But I also believe that Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, that you, you can't be unborn. Uh, what he started in you is done and it'll, it'll continue to be done. So, um, I really enjoyed the study tonight. It was nice to see you guys. And I hope all of you 
have a Merry Christmas. I, I'm going to be answering a short question. It'll be the last video I do before the holidays. Uh, and I'll be back after Christmas uh, once my family leaves. <laughs> See you guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right, Brother Ben, what did you think of the study tonight? Uh, I really enjoyed Philippians. I, I studied Philippians, but not, it's one of the epistles I studied uh, the least. And uh, even now, as I'm going through it again, I'm picking up all kinds of connections that I did not make before. Uh, in fact, the next couple of verses uh, are really, um, the next verses we haven't covered yet really helped me to answer the, a very difficult per, that passage later on. I think it's like 318 or something like that, where it says, their God is their belly. Uh, and uh, now, I, now I think I understand exactly what, what that means. Um, so I, I'm really enjoying it so far. And uh, you guys are helping me connect dots that I had not previously um, connected. So this is always, for me, a worthwhile experience and something I'm blessed by. And I'm looking forward to next week. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, I, I enjoyed the, the discussion tonight very much. Uh, I, I thought some there were some very uh, good insights and some uh, things that uh, are going to make me re reconsider and think, rethink uh, on that one particular verse, uh, how I'm going to be uh, using that. But um, yeah, well, I'm just glad that uh, Ben's uh, uh, well and able to uh, be back with us. Uh, I'm doing so much better. And, and so, but it turns out that now that we're all feeling good, uh, Friday is no Friday night fellowships. In case you didn't hear me in the beginning, it's that's Christmas day. So uh, we're gonna take that time uh, and not expect anybody to join the fellowship, but spend time with your, with your family on Christmas. Uh, but we will be back uh, on the following Sunday with our Sunday church service. So uh, please uh, join us uh, then. Renee, did you say you ha you have a, a program? You were talking about that before we started. Do you want to announce anything about that when that's happening? Uh, I I don't I don't even know if that guy's going to say yes. But I do have one on January seventh with. Gary Wayne, the author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, Thursday at 9 p.m., January 7th. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So make sure you join uh, Renee for that program. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody in the uh, the congregation. Uh, so a special thanks to the moderators. It's, it's not easy. And uh, especially when a moderator is trying to do the job to the best of their ability. Uh, we, we don't want another moderator to be correcting and challenging them. Uh, so please, uh, let's not let that happen again. Uh, if, if we do have a disagreement between the moderators, then we can discuss it privately after the program and uh, try, to, try to figure out a solution. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.